Mr. Kavi Kumar, who will actually be sharing on this topic on climate change, what it really means to be successful. So Mr. Kavi Kumar, he is a seasoned sustainability ESG and energy management professional with over 10 years of supply chain experience across Europe, Asia Pacific and Africa. His specialties include, include policy implementation, life cycle analysis, ESG risk, renewable energy, ESG finance, sustainability reporting, greenhouse gas inventory, waste management, and more. He was actually a nominee for the Straits Times Singaporean of the Year. He was also nominated by Green Biz and World Business Council for Sustainable Development 30 Under 30 Emerging Global Leader Enlisty as well as Sustainability and CSR Champion Honorary by Logistics and Supply Chain Management Society. So without further ado, please allow me to introduce and to welcome Mr. Kavi Kumar for the sharing on climate change, what it really means to businesses. Mr. Kavi Kumar, please. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. And uh, I hope all of you can hear me well. And uh, thanks to everyone this, for having me uh, this afternoon to, to share on this very uh, interesting yet uh, contentious topic, right? So. I, I I believe that uh, you know this is a this is a topic that uh, cuts across uh, a lot of sectors. Uh, if you're in public service or private sector, it still matters to you. And I think uh, Carmen has given a good overview of why we are having this. And I think a lot of it is centered upon the Singapore Green Plan for 2030. So today, uh, let me just give you an overview of how the narrative around climate change is growing. And I don't expect you to be very technical experts, but uh, I think I just want you to live with a very strong appreciation of the issues we are facing as a whole uh, when it comes to climate change and what businesses are doing well and what businesses are not doing too well. So yeah, so I've, I've started off with this slide, if you can see. So uh, obviously there's been tremendous ambition around uh, climate change, uh, right? So um, recent times, uh, uh, compared to, you know, not just in Singapore, globally, we've seen corporates uh, put out very ambitious goals around uh, climate change and, you know, re reduction of emissions and even net zero ambitions, as we call it. And as, as you can see in the Singapore Green Plan, national uh, nations also have plans to phase out emissions, uh, reduce their carbon footprint, and of course, contribute to the growing narrative around mitigating climate change. So um, a lot of action around that, but what we are increasingly seeing is also the fact that, you know, uh, while ambitions are there, are corporates really walking the talk, all right? Are they actually putting their money where they need to and dedicating resources to that? So uh, there are elements of what we call greenwashing that is sort of creeping up today, which means putting out very ambitious uh, goals, uh, roadmaps towards implementation to go net zero, to be carbon neutral even. But what is the action plan? I guess that's the big question mark that uh, we face uh, finding ourselves, be it uh, being shareholders of the company or being employees of the company or being vendors of the organization, right? So I've used this analogy of a watermelon where we propose or pronounce that we are green, but in fact, within we have a lot of questions for ourselves, right? Um, you know, certain things like lack of disclosure, lack of diversity and inclusion, no timelines. So if you see in the bottom left, you can see no timelines, strategy for achieving the goals. And of course, in not having data to really lead that change for decision-making. So you can see that uh, these are things that are creeping up, right? So when you look at corporate ambitions, Take it with a pinch of salt, go a bit deeper, ask them difficult questions, tough questions, ask them questions on how are you going about going, how are you going about these goals? What are the timelines? What are milestones? What are signposts you're looking for? So a lot of people are starting to invest in green companies, but my side cautionary wrote is that please do your due diligence when you talk about climate change, because increasingly uh people are trying to seek on how they can leverage uh climate change as a differentiator in their business and how they can leverage it as a business tool to enhance their corporate image so take it with a bit of a uh, pinch of salt 
So as we move on, we look at national ambitions, right? So uh, I think, as Carmen mentioned, we've started off with the Singapore Green Plan. And even at national levels, we lack a bit of strategy and action, right? So very bold ambitions, as you can see here. Uh, so this was by the Climate Action Tracker, last updated sometime uh, late last year. So it's very much valid till, uh, till date. And you can essentially see that uh, the countries that are actually doing well just cover 6% of the globe, right? And uh, these countries are essentially uh, Chile, the EU, UK, and Costa Rica. And you can see the vast majority of them have lack of information around disclosure, right? Some are even faring uh, very poorly, as you can see on the bottom right, right? A few nations there. So essentially, long story short, you could essentially see that at least close to 75% of countries that have made national ambitions around being net zero have inadequate implementation strategies towards that. So that is where we are at a very macro perspective when we are talking about climate change, right? So you can see the interlinkages between national ambitions and corporate ambitions, and you can actually see where the synergies lie. The synergies lie in terms of your strategy, action plan, implementation, reporting disclosure, and milestones. And as we move along, we know that one of the biggest things that we are trying to tackle is emissions, all right? So um, by the greenhouse gas, right, which we call the GHG protocol, we classify emissions into three groups. The first group is what we call scope one, which essentially addresses emissions that come from the sources of resources that are owned or controlled by the company. So if you are running a diesel plant or a manufacturing plant, any emission that is produced on site is what we count as scope one emissions. Or if you are working in an office space, any computers, data centers that generate emissions will also contribute to scope one. And that also includes to your transportation fleet that you use for your logistics. Scope two is what we call indirect emissions. And this is from the energy that you purchase to drive your operations. So most of the time is electricity from the national grid. Uh, in some instances where you're doing uh, uh, what we call refining or in the manufacturing industry, that's when you start to purchase heat, uh, heating and cooling energy, and of course, steam as well. But in most cases, the purchase energy for most organizations comes from the electricity that they buy from the grid, right? So, and the emissions depend on the source of the uh, depend on the source of the electricity, right? So what we have seen right now is a very strong maturity around scope one and scope two. You know, companies are able to measure them, companies are able to disclose them. But the challenge lies in scope three, and that's the bulk of where emissions are. These are where the value chain emissions are. These includes the emissions within your supply chain. For instance, if your colleagues are going on a business travel, uh, there are emissions, a trip to Europe, is that factored into your scope three emissions for your organization? If you're buying spare parts for your end product within your organization, are uh, the emissions generated from manufacturing these spare parts actually included in your inventory? So that is where we find um, the, 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 the key challenge, right? So that's where we are trying to uh, solve the issue of uh, what we call uh, identifying what is our scope three emissions, all right? So that is the, the biggest challenge that we are facing right now. And that is where a lot of resources, corporates are dedicating a lot of resources towards identifying your scope three for organizations, and of course, uh, defining uh, uh, you know, uh, how they can quantify and disclose this scope three emissions. So when you're talking about climate change, uh, if you don't, uh, if nothing else resonates with you, remember the biggest problem that corporates are trying to sort of target is what we call your scope three emissions. So we need trust. We need trust to work with our partners, with suppliers. We definitely need technology. We need technology in the form of good data from our supply chains, and we need to partner. We need to partner with our stakeholders in the value chain 
so that they can give us the right type of data to understand our holistic carbon footprint within the uh, ecosystem that we operate in. So as you can see, the small header there, our scope three emissions is typically close to about five to six times larger than our scope one and scope two combined. All right, next slide. All right, so what we are seeing right now is essentially a lot of voices coming into uh, sustainability and climate change. Uh, previously, it was an issue that was typically dealt with the state, you know, national government issues, policy, legislation, and that's it, right? And then increasingly, we have seen shareholders being interested in this whole social responsibility of corporates, right? Not just doing good for business, but also doing good for the environment and not always prioritizing profit over doing good, right? So that's the theory of shareholder capitalism that has been the, the whole remit of the last uh, 10 to 20 years. But increasingly within the last five to 10 years, we have been seeing this whole new movement of what we call stakeholder capital capitalism. So increasingly more actors are giving more scrutiny to how your sustainability ambitions shape, right? So stakeholders could be anyone and everyone who has a vested interest in your organization. It could be an NGO, it could not just only be a shareholder, it could be an employee, it could be a prospective employee, or it could also be an investor, all right? So I'll touch on the topic on investment later, but investors are having greater scrutiny into the companies they invest in. They no longer look for short-term profit, but they're also looking for long-term value creation beyond the short term. And this is what we call the ESG space, where we look at the environment, the social issues, and of course, strong governance mechanisms within the organization. So that is how sustainability has sort of transformed over the year. So everyone within your ecosystem or what you call your supply chain matter equally, and you need to treat them with importance and understand what are the issues of concern they have to your value proposition. All right, so now I move on to another thing or topic of great interest in recent times, which is finance, all right? Uh, now the increasingly used term in the finance space is what we call green finance, right? You heard about, you hear in the same length about sustainable finance, you hear about themes like green bonds, ESG investing, they all fall under the same umbrella, right? And why is that the case? Because strategically, financial institutions are gov and governments are trying to use finance as a lever to get companies to be more environmentally friendly, to be more green, to be more sustainable, right? So finance has the power to change because a lot of companies depend on capital for expansion, uh, for organic growth, for acquisitions, for transitions, all right? So there's another term, what we call transition finance, where we use finance as a lever to transform or transit uh, from a particular type of industry to a more sustainable form of operating and manufacturing. So that's just one aspect of it. But again, as you see from this picture, you would have realized that not all is as rosy at as it seems, right? So we call this the fact that banks are still financing companies who are actually uh, sort of in the fossil fuel or coal business even. So you can see in red, essentially uh, several companies, uh, rather in blue, rather you can see some of these companies that are actually still financing fossil fuel based organizations. So in recent times, a lot of banks have actually come out to say that, hey, we will stop within a certain amount of time to sort of move out of this space. So that is very transformational. That is very ambitious, but still a lot of banks are still financing historic uh, transactions uh, with fossil fuel clients. So that has got to change if you are to really see that transition to a greener environment. So financial in this financial space, we are seeing a lot of greenwashing. And just if we read this new, uh, if, I think the news just came out this morning, 
I think the Monetary Authority of Singapore is actually putting in a framework to actually monitor and evaluate how green equities are. So that's going to be quite transformational. So they're going to put forward an ESG framework that actually assesses green equity, right? Uh, so that there are no claims of greenwashing. And I think there are also ambitious statements made by the MAS in terms of uh, financing of companies, in terms of drawing down the investments in unsustainable companies, and of course, reducing the, the emissions within the portfolios that they are financing. So if you have not read it, I think it just was announced in the press release this morning. Have a read about it and understand what the Monetary Authority of Singapore is doing in this space. And the next bit is what we call renewable energy. So as you can see, I'm just touching on some of the core themes so that I don't go too deep into any specific ones, but to give you a flavor of what are the core themes that are in the climate change space where corporates need to sort of uh, be aware or are doing a lot uh, in today's world. And the next point is where we have a clear business case for renewable energy, all right? So this is what we call the energy transition. Some call it decarbonization efforts. Some call it, you know, some have a rosier term, they call it our journey to net zero. So there are a lot of terms used for that, right? And I think when we talk about renewable energy, I think what resonates most to in Singapore at least is solar, right? Solar has been a proven source of renewable energies. Uh, we are trying to expand as much as possible our ability to sort of tap on solar and store that for our strategic needs. And I think the Singapore Green Plan has rightly highlighted what our ambitions are in the longer term, all right? Uh, so besides uh, solar, I think there's other types of energy, uh, renewable energy that have proved to be a, vi a viable proposition. In parts of the world, uh, wind is well used. For example, in India, there's a lot of wind farms. Uh, in Japan, Vietnam as well. Some of them use tidal energy, all right, for instance. And now we are talking about exploring other types of energy to really power our uh, energy demands, and these include hydrogen. Uh, there's also talk about nuclear, given the recent energy crisis that has been happening with Russia, where the dependence on Russia natural gas has actually affected supply chains around the world. This has led to a sort of deceleration of corporate decarbonization efforts. So such black swan events and such geopolitical tensions can affect a country's decarbonization efforts or corporate's decarbonization effort. So you have to scale back and that, and there's also talk about reopening coal plants in parts of Europe because of uh, uh, energy crunch that has been caused by the Russia-Ukraine war. But clearly we have a business case for renewable energy. There's a lot of investment going into renewable energy uh, with the with long-term horizons. I think at least for solar, there's a proven business case, uh, not just in Singapore, but globally. And we will see new forms of uh, renewable energy taking shape as they are made viable uh, for scalability. And the next theme is of course, on somewhere touching on energy, but of course it moves to another form of credit called carbon, right? So this has been, uh, I mean, the carbon offsetting or carbon eco credit ecosystem has been gaining traction. Uh, a lot of companies are purchasing voluntary carbon credits to offset their emissions. This is an easy form of reducing your liability, reducing your tax liability, because if you're subject to carbon tax, then one of the ways you might want to offset is to purchase carbon credits. So uh, if you... If you do recall, Singapore also has a carbon tax in place uh, that is more of a mandatory emissions reduction uh, fiscal tool, um, and that is slated to increase uh, in trenches over the next couple of years. And that would be a more aggressive form of monetary tool used to reduce uh, carbon emissions within our industries in Singapore. But this snapshot gives you a what the global perspective is in terms of voluntary carbon credit ecosystems, you can see that it has gained traction and it's coming closer to home as well. So last year, China launched one of the biggest uh, voluntary emissions trading program. It's been running well. It's got a lot of 
uh, sort of interests, uh, a lot of stakeholders being involved in it. And towards, if you come closer to home in Singapore, we have the climate uh, air carbon exchange, which is, which is actually essentially a platform for trading of carbon credits. So the carbon credits are here to stay. The demand for carbon credits are increase, increasing because corporates have ambitious goals that they have to meet within a certain timeline. And that means they have to really step up their game. So carbon credits provide quick win solutions to really offset your footprint. But for the long term, you need more transformational change, right? So over the last couple of months and years, the carbon credit price across the globe has actually increased uh, at least two to three fold. So that actually represents the size of demand for carbon credits in the markets today. And just shifting a bit, I think one of the biggest things when we talk about sustainability and corporates going green in the efforts to combat climate change is the use of technology. Uh, the intersections between technology and sustainability are getting narrower or in fact overlapping. All right, So one is a subset of another. And data essentially is the new oil in my opinion because data has the power to really go deep and collect information that you would not have been able to do manually, right? And with sophisticated systems, we will be seeing more customized sets of data that companies can actually use to understand their footprint, the efficiency of the equipment that they use, the type of workforce they have, uh, the cost of energy they, they, they incur, how much offsets they need, and how they can actually look at new forms of technology to even explore other sorts of carbon capture or air capture technology. So data, if used right, can have very strong implications in the sustainability sector and can help solve a lot of the issues that we face in, in sustainability today. So it brings about a democratization of knowledge. It brings about a democratization of finance. And you have you hear elements of blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and you know some governments are quite supportive of it as a form of currency, while others are not. So tech is an enabler if used right, uh, with fair amount of transparency and disclosure uh, to promote equality within our value chains and transparency as well. So please leverage tech where possible to optimize your supply chains, understand your supply chains better, go further upstream to the source and identify issues where you can actually have carbon or emission savings and reductions and enable your journey in, in climate change and sustainability. All right. And this adds or builds onto what I say earlier, the convergence between sustainability and technology today is clear, and that typically results in transformation if done right, right? So the intersections between these three paradigms are very much uh, there if you do it right and understand what are the issues that you are trying to address within sustainability and climate change, all right? So it helps you build your performance around reporting. It helps you to collect collective intelligence of your supply chain, your employee workforce. Uh, it also enables you to do a pulse check on where you stand in, la in view of your competitors. So data is useful for benchmarking, Data is useful to set baselines towards a 2025 or a 2030 corporate goal. All right, so it helps you understand your status quo, but also sets you on a pathway to have incremental or even transformational change in your sustainability journey. So how these things, these three elements come together might differ to, from organization to organization based on capacity, uh, funding, uh, the relevant skill sets and very important leadership, right? Corporate leadership is very crucial to enable sustainability. So if you look at the companies that have good corporate practice, sustainability practices, it's typically driven by strong leadership that has enabled that transformative change within these organizations. All right. And this part is what I want to, to share uh, a bit more. And this is what we call purpose-driven supply chain. So, right, today, a uh, company's value proposition lies in its ability to create impact, right? So what we are looking for is that sort of purpose in terms of 
what is the wider remit that you can have to serve that organization as an organization to your stakeholders, right? So we have moved away from the traditional. So if you look at the left hand side in the top uh, left hand column on the top left of this slide, you see that this is what we call the traditional approach, right? Where we look at the impact of our activities on the environment. So we have passed that stage, right? Now companies are very good at measuring scope one and scope two. They are, they, some are almost there with scope three, uh, but the vast majority are not there. Water usage, checking how much you have extracted from your water bodies, how much you have replenished, the amount of pollution that you create, uh, how much land that you've used or converted if you're in the agricultural business. So you're able to identify and, and understand all this. But today, things are a bit more different. You look at what's happening outside and see how that impacts your organization. All right. Right. So look at that per, that, that second uh, column there in terms of value creation. And that's what today's organizations are all about. It's all about creating value. How do you remain relevant to your stakeholders? And that's just not your investors or shareholders, but also your employees, the NGO partners you work with, your suppliers, and most importantly, um, your prospective employees as well. And that is where you understand all types of risks. The physical risk, for instance, of climate change, right? If climate change is real and you have an office that is beside a coastal area, have you access, assessed the risk of climate change or rise in sea level to your office operations? Transition risks, right? What happens if there's a new policy on green energy? Have, are you ready or prepared for that change? Have you done your homework to enable that transition to enable you to procure green oil energy and does your infrastructure support that? So that's the what we call the transi transition risk. And then of course, market changes and the reputational risk that comes along uh, with not being sustainable as well. So that is where companies are actually investing a lot to understand the risk posed um, by externalities on the organization so that they can remain relevant. And at the bottom, you can basically see the futures cone, all right? And this we, what this is essentially all about futures and foresight, right? Do a futures and foresight exercise to understand what are the possible sustainability scenarios that can affect your organization, not just climate change, but look at black swan events like COVID, right? No one saw COVID coming and that actually transformed a lot of organizations in how they work, how they engage with employees, how they transform their business. And that's where the term green recovery actually came about, right, post-COVID. So have a look at that and understand your value chain. And today it's also important uh, to really talk about leadership within your organization uh, to, to drive change, right? Uh, as I said, a lot of companies that have good sustainability ESG practices have very strong leadership uh, focus on these areas. You know, they are very focused in investing in ESG. That's where the finance and investment comes in. They are very centered upon operating models, business models, and of course, hiring the right people as well. People who are passionate about the issue, people who are experienced, have, have good knowledge about handling ESG issues, people who are centered upon creating value for the organization, new sorts of value for the organization. So that's where we see this whole of transformation shift, right? It's not just about the business. It's also about how you report on your ESG performance or sustainability performance. So no more traditional financial reporting. You're going to diversify your reporting to also look at all this uh, ESG and sustainability metrics and how you integrate your finance with ESG. And that's where the integrated reporting takes place. And then, of course, how do you reinvent yourself as a business? How do you ensure that you stay relevant in 10 years down the road in terms of the energy that you use, the people that you have in your organization, and the business which you use to revenue, generate revenue for your organization? So leadership is very crucial. Uh, competent leadership should really be far-sighted, should explore all paradigms of possible and plausible scenarios that can happen within your ecosystem that will affect your business. And these are just some of the trends, the core trends in my opinion, that will define how supply chain transforms for corporate when it comes to climate change, right? Uh, it's already clear if you see the first point that regulation will drive a lot of this change. Uh, the Singapore Stock Exchange has actually increased 
over the last couple of years, the amount of mandatory disclosure required by corporates that are listed. MES has also now issued guidelines in terms of assessing the green credentials of equity, and we will see more to come, all right? And then there's also the threat to nature and biodiversity, right? So what we are looking at right now is nature-based solutions, all right? NBS, we call it. So that's the new buzzword as well. So we are looking at nature-based solutions for carbon offsetting. We are looking at nature-based solutions to sequester carbon. We are also looking at nature-based solutions to really have that long-term fundamental shift in terms of you know, our sustainability ambitions. And then of course, the conversations around climate and energy transition are increasing. Year on year, you see, a, you've, I think at least over the last two, three years, you'd have seen a lot of conversations on this, right? I mean, two years back or even five years back, you will not see probably Avantis having this, having convened this discussion with uh, the, the audience here as well. So growing interest, growing scrutiny, has increased the forums for conversation around climate change, and that will continue to grow, all right? And we are no longer talking about climate change or mitigation. Today, we should be talking about climate resilience. How do we build climate resilience to empower us to be future ready, uh, to really conduct business in the way we should be doing, and how do we support and build ecosystems for that, right? That's very important. So it's no longer about climate change or mitigation or adaption, uh, adaptation, but it's all about climate resilience today. All right, and investors are very much interested, right? There's a lot of funds out there waiting to be invested in organizations, startups, or you know, uh, social enterprises, but investors want to know more. They want to know, particularly on social issues today, are you embracing diverse, uh, diversity and inclusion? Are you, uh, you know, are you very much inclusive in your hiring practices? How are you treating your workers? Is there more female representation on the board? So these are areas of discussion. And as I said, social issues will be part of the bigger discussion in time to come. All right, so sustainability is a complicated matter. It's not so easy. There's a lot of competing voices. Uh, different stakeholders have different views on this. Uh, we can't find the perfect solution, but we have to find the best solution for the most of our stakeholders, right? So it questions uh, our, our ethical principles, our morals, uh, you know, our professional backgrounds, you know, and of course, you know, there's, there's no, we have not found a global standard to objectively measure a successful sustainability initiative, right? So we continue to reiterate the process. We need to have the right experts at the table to, to really bring some knowledge and insights into a very complicated, complex problem. So, and we all have a part to play, right? No matter which industry you belong to, no matter which sector you are in or what your role within an organization is, you all have a part to play in, in solving this very complex, complicated, or what we call a wicked problem. All right, so the last thing I just want to wrap up, I think uh, this has been part of a, the, the thought school on how good leaders should be in the sustainability field. All right, uh, and uh, we call it the, the uh, at least we term it the seven C's, right? So I think a lot of us are familiar with the four C's, but the seven C's are essentially on courage to basically take on such complex problems and find stakeholders and solutions. It's not an overnight issue that can be sorted out. It will take months, even years but we have to chip at it, right? And of course, club collaboration is very important and that's why divergent voices are very crucial to the organization. So not just look within your organization, you know, go out, speak to your competitors, speak to your peers, speak to your counterparts in other organizations, ask what they are doing, uh, share ideas, collaborate, and that's where change happens, right? So you have to come out of your walls and really collaborate and be very honest and transparent. And you need to be creativity, right? uh, you need to be creative, right? So that is very important. Uh, no one envisioned COVID to take uh, sort of take root. So we need to be creative to envision as many scenarios, no matter how silly they may be, because you never know one day that could happen, right? Or that could manifest. And of course, always put the community or the, the communities that you're serving at the heart of the issue and ensure that you are very honest about your, um, your performance, your sustainability performance, right? A lot of organizations tend to greenwash and if you look at sustainability reports, they only speak about the good things. So they lack a bit of balance in that. So 
good sustainability reports or reporting and disclosure are about candor. It's about finding the right balance and meeting the fact that certain things worked, but certain things did not work. And this is what we're going to do about it. And of course, capital is very important. No longer capital linked to financial assets, but also capital linked to social and environmental assets. Put a dollar value to what it means to maintain your employees' happiness. Put a dollar value to what it means to protect an area of land that is situated around your organization. Right. So try to put a dollar value on social and environmental issues. And that is when you have a very holistic uh, capital assessment of where you lie in terms of sustainability and climate change. And lastly, have a lot of compassion in when you make decisions, especially uh, have a lot of empathy when you're making tough decisions on sustainability, right? Be it on diversity and inclusion, be it supporting an underprivileged community or society, or be it just, uh, you know, supporting the wider goals of your SDGs in that sense, right? So these are the seven Cs that can drive sustainable transformation within your corporation. Yeah, so I think with this, I'm done. Um, I just leave you with this quote. I thought this was a very purposeful quote from what we call the chief impact officer, right? So we are always used to the term CIO and we refer that to the chief information officer, but yeah, organizations are also getting creative. They are also getting more sophisticated and we have a chief impact officer, right? So yeah, so I'll leave you with this quote and I guess uh, this captures the essence of what we discussed today and uh, happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kavi Kumar, for your very insightful sharing. Thank you so much. Uh, so we can jump straight into the Q&A. All right, uh, we do have quite a number of questions, interesting ones actually that are coming in. Uh, let me, uh, okay, let's, let's check in our first question. What are some common mistakes uh, that companies make when approaching climate change, sustainable, climate change or sustainability? Based on yeah. your experience. Yeah. Mm. The, the common mistake is trying to replicate what other companies are doing without knowing mm. your capacity and capability, right? So that's the most common mistake that I see uh, when we see that, hey, our competitor or our, our peer organization is doing something. All right. Oh, yeah. Mm. They have invested in this. They have invested in a solar uh, panel uh, for the factory. Mm -hmm. We should also do the mm. same. But come mm. back to your central uh, value proposition. What is it that you want to achieve? What is your vision for sustainability? Is it cascaded throughout your organization? Make sure that this is something that is linked to your own value proposition and this is something that you see value in instead of just feeling uh, or just acknowledging the fact that this is something that we need to do to stay ahead of the game or stay on par with our competitors. So people I mean, with the the, uh, the sort of uh, democratization of knowledge and information, uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's very common to essentially uh, try to mimic what other companies are doing because we mm -hmm. see that it's a quick win solution maybe, or perhaps it's something mm -hmm. that, hey, you know, we need to do. If not, we get left behind. So come back to your central position, talk to your mm -hmm. stakeholders, understand if this is what they want instead of just, mm -hmm. you know, pushing something that you think it's, important because someone else is doing it. Right. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Kavi Kumar, for uh, sharing that advice for that as well. Um, okay. So actually, we have another question uh, that's quite interesting. Uh, let me just... Um, okay. All right. So we actually have a question from uh, the audience, uh, from Darren. So he actually is uh, checking in ESG. He says, in ESG, everyone focuses on environment aspect of ensuring sustainability. But what about governance? Other than training and instilling corporate compliance culture, what other effective solutions are there to ensure good governance within an organization? Would you really advise on that? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a very good question. And I think a lot of focus when we talk as a layman on ESG is centered upon environment and society. Uh, but G, the G is also very important. And how do we have frameworks of accountability? And that's where corporates have to build them organically. Uh, so it's not mm -hmm. just about, uh, you know, good governance in terms of having boardroom diversity. But today we are increasingly talking about even CEOs being accountable mm -hmm. uh, for uh, the ESG performance 
of their company. So there's also talk about, hey, should we pack CEO remuneration to ESG performance of a company? So that's some that's one train of thought. And then the other train of thought is saying that, hey, you know, we should not because CEOs are, why should we incentivize CEOs to do that? Because it should be already part of their mandate. So that is the narrative that is going on. But these are what we see uh, what uh, are, are the sort of cutting edge thought processes and around uh, and narratives around good governance within an organization. So pegging of CEO uh, remuneration to corporate ESG performance, uh, ensuring that uh, within your corporate or within your board, you have a specific board member with extensive sustainability experience. And that's an increasing trend that we are seeing right now. If you look at the board of uh, like Comfort Del Group, for example, they've got someone who's on sustainability on the board. So increasingly, board dynamics is also increase, uh, becoming a bit more diverse to actually uh, pay uh, to have some subject matter experts to mm. advise on the very strategic issues related to sustainability. And of course, the last bit is about you know uh, having that sort of good uh, disclosure and reporting processes where you know, we, you know the, 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 the governance structure, for instance, within corporates, you are having not just financial committees or remuneration committees, you're also having very specific. Now, a lot of organizations have established ESG committees. So, you know, board members or independent board directors actually sit on the committee uh, to really deliberate on the ESG performance of the company. And this board actually reports into... Uh, the, the overall board of directors as well. So these are some of the new uh, themes that are emerging in that space to build effective governance around ESG within a corporate. So training is one, um, but I also want to iterate that companies are now considering giving training to board members to get them up to speed on ESG performance and what's happening in the ESG space around the world. Mm. Okay, thanks Kavi Kumar for that. Uh, due to time constraints, we can take one last question. Uh, there's also someone who is asking. Uh, he, he thanks you. He thanks for thanks you for the sharing. He was sharing that uh, tech tech T E C H tech was mentioned repeatedly. Are there specific recommendations to consider? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, I've used. I mean, I, I also am mindful that I've used the term tech quite loosely today. But uh, my, my guidance to organizations and corporate is do not just get immersed in tech for the sake of getting immersed in tech, right? Have a review of your existing processes. If things are working well, don't rock the boat. But if you have seen a proper use case for tech to come in to really go deeper to get information that you, you do not have, that's where you, you need to invest in tech. So right now, companies typically in the ESG space use tech to... Uh, sort of, uh, sort of aggregate reporting, uh, support their reporting processes, and of course, one of the things when I talk about tech is having real time, right? So, enable processes that give you real time data to establish benchmarks and uh, spot trends in that sense. So, don't don't embrace tech for the sake of embracing tech. Understand your your your, your organization. Make sure that's capacity and capability within your team to use tech the right way. So make sure you build a talent pool, there's receptiveness in using tech and understand, start small before scaling up. You know, don't transform the whole thing, but start on a small pilot, uh, do a study, do a post-mortem exercise and see what it costs you, what you have gotten out of that, what your employees and stakeholders think about that and then build on it. So don't be too uh, hasty in moving into tech just because, you know, people are doing tech and sustainability today, we should be, if not, we will be left out. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Kavi Kumar. I think I, I, I do, uh, I do appreciate the fact that you shared about how we need to start small, or at least we shouldn't be too hasty <laughs> into jumping into things uh, just because um, you know it's, it's the trend right now. So I think it's definitely very important for us to do the right research. And then from there, we can begin with a small group pilot project, I would say maybe, and then we can expand from there as well. Thank you so much for that. Absolutely. Uh, so we have um, we do have a couple of questions, however, due to time constraint, we will actually take note of them and they will be answered once again after uh, today's festival and uh, through our social media platform, our Facebook page. So thank you, Kavi Kumar. 